Connolly, my, this is my daughter Sheila's restaurant, so thank you Sheila Connolly for hosting this. Yay! We are very honored tonight to have three extremely talented poets and writers reading, and we are also very honored to have a new show of art hanging up, which has been contributed by a great artist, Janet Coleman. Would you take a bow there, Janet? <laughs> the most amazing thing about this art, I think, besides the fact that it's fabulous, beautiful, inspiring, is that Janet is a corporate lawyer, a practicing corporate lawyer, who started painting just 10 years ago. So I think her work is very inspiring, energizing, and we are very happy to have it here. Now, the first... Also, I should tell you that Ray Howe, who is the founder of Lone Oak Press, is filming this event to uh, broadcast it on the Internet. So be sure your makeup is on. <laughs> Our first reader tonight is Kathleen Jesney. And Kathleen is another inspiring story because she started writing when she was 45. So all of she has tons of stuff stored up, right? She is a poet, obviously, a law mentor awardee. Her work is forthcoming in Prairie Schooner. She has been published in many other venues. She holds an MFA from Warren Wilson College, which is sort of a recent MFA, is it not? July, yes. Kathleen Jesney. Thanks, Carol. I really, what I really wanted to do was to have this stuff in my back pocket and just pull it out and, you know, hold it up here, but somebody told me that would show lack of respect for my own work, and so I'm trying to, to respect my work here. And, but it's in my way. I'm going to start with a poem called uh, The Arsonist. And this poem, I'm reading this poem for Emily because uh, at, not too long ago I heard Emily read and she talked about the, the writer being responsible for uh, his or her darkness and depth. And so I wanted to read this poem, The Arsonist. The long fall grass bends toward her, yellowed in the wind, waves her on. It rises above her on the hillside, almost to the houses, below, sloping to the river, where the water's gray fists chop the whirring air. She rips out handfuls of straw and weeds, piles them up half her height. The wind wants to take them, but she holds them down with her lunchbox. What she sees is not what is here, a small contained fire over which to toast hot dogs and bread. What she sees out of the narrow frame of childhood is a landscape smaller and safer than anything she really knows. The eye of her imagination diminishes whatever becomes monstrous, whatever is dangerous, so that she can find its place in herself without terror and so she doesn't know what will happen when she kneels aside the wind to strike the match how the grass will catch how the wind will take the fire tangle it and toss it up the hill and she will not be able to stop it it will never stop becoming fire <laughs> try as she might she will never be able to remember it quite right the way the fire truck sounds with its doctor roar, the soft swish of voices on the streets as the news passes, and later the thought of burning up with the grass, how easy it would have been, and the way the hill becomes a black patch of shame she can't look at until snow comes and covers it. Once at the end would be great. Um, that poem is part of a series of poems I worked on for the last um, two and a half years. Louder, did you say? Really? Yeah. Oh, I hear something beeping. Yeah. Is that 
Is that this thing? This side? Can you hear me now? No. How about this? What's that beeping noise? Okay, so it's... it's the, be the beeping is part of the poem. Okay. Um, I wrote a series of poems um, on the subject of fire, and they were based partly on um, a fire that happened in my uh, hometown in 1910, long before I was born. But <clears throat> I also wrote... That, that is really bothering me. What's... Is it bothering you too? Yes. Okay, then we have to end it. We have to find a way to... Okay, I just have to talk louder, right? And then it won't do that. But if I stand back, then you can't hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, I'll try to speak up. The next poem is called Fire Eater, and it's another uh, poem in that series. And it was written for, uh, it was written for a boy named Chucky with whom I went to first grade. Fire Eater. In first grade, he sat in front of me, and I could watch the white, angry ropes of flesh on his hands, his cheeks, the back of his neck, examine the bare places on his head where hair wouldn't grow. I became used to the odd way his head tilted and nodded when he walked, a little sideways, as if something were always pulling or pushing him. I wondered if the same fire had melted the rest of him, the parts I couldn't see, his skinny arms and thighs, his back. I wondered if any of him were smooth. When Mrs. Smith held him on her lap, though he wanted to get down, he kicked her because that is all he could do. And that sweet teacher, took him into the classroom alone and raged and raged at him. I walked by twice because I needed to know what she could do. Even the boy, that burned, scarred, trembling boy, could be burned some more and would be. Okay, change of pace here. Beeping or otherwise. The beeping will go with this. They'll go with this poem. It's called Not Lot's Wife. It takes salt to look back. To feel the wound, she turned to rub salt into it. Then, after she stood in contemplation of her past, became salt and stillness, she turned again toward the rest of her life and began to move slowly at first then jogging, then running, and she came into a place where they needed salt. that he ran for president so that every room in America would have a decent loud loudspeaker system. But he didn't win, unfortunately. <laughs> so now, can you hear me? So, so now, here I am. <laughs> Thanks, Eugene. Thank you, I'm sorry. Humility is a good thing. This poem is called Afraid to Look, Afraid to Look Away. And I wrote this poem as part of a group called the Renshi Group in which uh, you get a circle of people together and each person has to use the last line of the person before, the poem from the person before as, as the title of his or her poem. And you go around like that until you get crazy. And, but the fun thing about a Renshi is that you take this line and it becomes the title of your poem and you go somewhere that you 
would not have gone without that line pushing you. And so I got this line from um, a teacher that I had at, at Warren Wilson, Eleanor Wilner, and so this poem is for her. Afraid to look, afraid to look away. Moonlight breaks on the fir trees in the dark forest. She waits for you. The garden of stones casts shadows, hover on the ground. The breadcrumbs are the old trail of pebbles, is white in the moonlight, has no beginning. Leave this false trail and all trails. Walk toward what you don't know, the moon will take you there. The house is gingerbread and sugar will fill you up at first. You will think you have found childhood. But she is inside what you eat devours you. Stay with her. Let her feed you as she will stoke her oven. Keep your brother safe from her dim eyes. Cannot see you. Wait for her to go to the fire. Will move you. You must stay and watch her burn. If you forget and look away, you will forget. Now the fire burns on in the garden and wake the stones. Uh, this poem uh, is a pretty recent one, which is by way of excuse if it's a little rough. I'm reading two more poems. This one's a little bit longer. It's in ten sections, but I, I, I'm not, they're very short. But I'm not going to read the section t uh, numbers, so if you want to count, you'll have to do that yourself. The trip home. I'll just pause between the sections so you'll know where, they, where the pauses are. The trip home. I like abandoned buildings, how they keen and sway in the wind all gray. It takes only a few years for them to sag and lower themselves to the ground. They sing and whistle as they wait for a bigger wind to come along. Houses go wild when they lose their owners. Feral buildings running rampant in the tall grass, peeking through vines and lilacs, and through split foundations spilling out their dark airs. Places where you seldom go give up their changes to you. Sometimes everything's gone with the chimney. Was it arson? Is it tempting to burn down something empty and unwanted? What we abandon becomes fodder for fire or earth. The earth will always take it back. We want, too, to be taken back by our mother to crawl up inside her. The sunflowers cock their heads and listen in the field. They are tired of following the sun. And now, just at twilight, they rest and whisper to each other. I am going home to listen, to record my mother's life. I'm hoping to hear something new in the stories I heard as a child, find in them something that never got told. But she is adept at not telling what never got told. The sunflowers in the rain know where the sun should be, and they face east, obedient to its absence. They went back home when she was a child. She remembers how unknown relatives folded her into the family. Now she is the last. What she remembers is all there is. When she's gone, it folds up and disappears in the night. The past is a gypsy caravan. The past is a migration of monarchs. The past is a pool of water in which one glimpses something. The past is invisible. The past is a lamp seen from a great distance at nightfall. The past is what falls between the cracks on the floor. The past is a river into which everything is thrown. The past is marks on stone. The past is what refuses to remember. 
The sunflowers are an audience, a crowd. I'm standing on the riverbank. The orange windsock should be just down the river to the left. There it is. I'm at home, strange in this place I left 33 years ago. Yes, there is the river bend, and Canada across to the east. These things line up in memory. Call it. Memory is invited not by the mind, but by the eye, the ear, the nose and mouth. The tongue calls memory. The sunflowers are dark and drooped, bit by early frost. They no longer look for the sun or listen to each other. Only the ground hears them now. That was ten. My last poem is also a Renshi poem. Uh, done with a different group of people, and so consequently it has a totally different feeling to it. It's called Howling a Wolf. Howling. A wolf, or perhaps a den of fox kits yipping at the moon. Inside the house, she tears behind her hand. Singing is a form of desire. Like pride. Why more than one? There's only one moon. It draws up and loosens. All singing is danger. All sound means. Not just song. The intimate syllables of the self exposed. Suppose the wolf knows that and breaks into the house anyway with breath. There is a part of us that knows no rules, admits no boundaries, is without. Wolf, fox, owl, whatever you are that howls at night, be wary of me, for I may sing you to sleep. <laughs> nice poems is right. Can you all hear in the back? Good. No, I just, I'm very happy. That was fabulous work. It was a great reading. Congratulations. Can we say it again? Like that. Oh, Paul, drop a few papers and then you won't care what I say. It'll just be so relieved that I'm talking. I have been a great fan of John Mancheski's work for probably 25 years. And I was so enthralled hearing him read from some of his newest work recently at Barnes and Noble, and it is um, it's absolutely wonderful. I hope you're going to read from some of your new work, are you? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> he was John was recently in Poland, where he contacted family to gather material. He is the winner of many literary awards, including the Akron Poetry Prize which all of you poets will appreciate hearing this, was judged by Mary Oliver, Ooh. which includes publication of a book in 2001, which you are now working on. He is the author of three books, The Spiders, The Reconstruction of Light, both from New Rivers Press, and Gravity from Texas Tech, which I am presently reading, which is very good. Patricia Hample calls his work radiating and exciting. Widely published in journals and anthology, he orchestrates the annual moon reading at Balin Poetry Park, which features 30 readers. I don't even want to think about the sound here. <laughs> John Mincheski. Yeah, the moon poetry reading is kind of an interesting uh, event. It's 30 readers reading three minutes a piece, for which they are paid uh, some money, like $15 a piece for reading. If they go over, they are fined, uh, or they are docked, five, five dollars per minute. So uh, that's to keep poets honest. I'm going to start with some brand new poems. Uh, this is called The Word for Me, and it's, uh, I, I have done and do a lot of work in schools, as a poet in the schools, traveling around Minnesota and so on. Uh, and this, uh, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. The Word for Me. A Vietnamese first grader told me the word for butterfly. 
and what fluttered weightlessly in her mouth took on leather wings in mine. She laughed from a place a word is as much song as lips and tongue. This is too hard for you, she said, and gave me a single syllable starting with M. What's it mean, I asked. Me, she said. I carefully pronounced it, and students giggled behind their hands, nodding me on as I spoke their word, my word now, alive and different each time I said it, but getting closer each time to who I was, this me pacing the room, dragging my wings in the dust. <laughs> This is another one uh, involving language um, called Ponte Garibaldi. And it's great speaking other languages because you don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and you can take such risks. Ponte Garibaldi means Garibaldi Bridge. Uh, Garibaldi was a guy who unified Italy back in the 1860s or 70s, uh, took it out of the realm of city-states and so on. Uh, but it's about me mispronouncing the word ponte. Uh, and I asked the guy, where, where was puta Garibaldi? <laughs> so. That first year in Rome, when the language was stones under my tongue, I stopped a businessman by the, po by the post office to bum a cigarette and ask, where was puta Garibaldi? He looked at me with starched, stinging eyes. Yes, he had heard correctly. A scruffy, 20-year-old American smoking a pungent field throw, calling Italy's great unifier a whore. <laughs> Punta Garibaldi, I said again. Do you know where? He had no words and raised his nose, setting sail into less turgid air. I could wander hours until I found a familiar landmark, Via del Corso, or the Pantheon, or finish the cigarette and catch a bus, for the morning air was full of cabbages and carnations thrown in the street after a grand party. Whose? I asked no one else, but they all knew that was clear. <laughs> In honor, of, in honor of the start of winter, here's a poem about snow called April Snow in Niswa. Uh, about the last snowfall of the season. It's for my friend Terry Ford, uh, whose voice just kind of drifts into occasionally. April Snow in Niswa. It must be the price for praising the moon, this cold cappuccino slopping into my shoes like an old emptiness. Rescue me, slush. Fill me, dander of pruning angels. Shall we make tracks through the Robert Frost woods? Shall we shuffle off to? Repel down spiders, elegant ninjas, like rabbits through the spendthrift wind into the magician's hat, the blue-black ink of night. Oh, these thirsty tongues of grass will honor all your frequent flyer miles. <laughs> this next one is for my daughter, uh, who works as a, a, a costumer on Broadway. Uh, she helps dress uh, actors, and she works in cleaning the costumes and fixing them and so on. Uh, she was working on uh, Jesus Christ Superstar uh, recently, and one of her jobs was called Blood Call. That's where they uh, wash the, quote, blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the costumes for the next show. <laughs> blood Call. Every day, sometimes twice if there's a matinee, she washes the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the costumes so they're ready for the next performance. Robes of legionnaires, the bloody clothes of Christ himself. She's heard this song so many times, they only register as cues for the next costume change. Once, an understudy, excited he'd be playing a major role, forgot where he was on the stage and fell backwards into the orchestra pit. 
During the curtain call, he's the only one who got a standing ovation. <laughs> she takes the costumes from the dryer, straightens them, checking for damage as she fits them on hangers bearing actors' names. She slips outside for a cigarette after the show, and audience members watch closely to see if she's somebody. You can never tell. A well-meaning woman <coughs> approached her, thinking she looked like Mary, mother of Jesus, or that other Mary, the Magdalene. Have you, she said, been washed in the blood of the Lamb? <laughs> Twice today already, honey. <laughs> And I've got two ma two full May tags getting rid of it right now. <laughs> it's fun reading, isn't it? Now, this is called November. It's, it's a little bit of a change of pace. November. It's, it's in three sections, but like Kath, I won't read the sections. Why, why is this? It's tradition. I don't know why. We don't read the section numbers. Maybe because it sounds too much like mathematics or something. November. Night's lowered its drawstring, and the day seeps in. Venus riding high at dawn, both hands on the handlebars and gunning it hard. This black coffee, an homage to the stars and lingering frost on windshields. Happiness, where are you going now? Hat pulled low over your eyes. Every dream the trees grow remains visible against the sky after the wet snow turns them black first. November, the jukebox of crows, a dog barking at the wild universe. I give an inch. You take a mile in this country where we welcome the value of distance. November, the ancient wooden smell of Birkenau lingers. Surely it is a remnant of coal and not the frozen rags of prisoners. Does forgiveness have a smell? Does vengeance? Did the circling angel of hope leave anything besides dust and old wood? the morning trill of blue jays and dormant trees, anything besides snow. These are uh, a few poems by or from my uh, forthcoming manuscript. Uh, I always write about my family uh, because, I don't know, it's so immediate. It's, it's what writers do. It's our way of getting even, I guess. This is a poem about my grandfather um, who came to this country when he was 17 from Poland. It's called Bronisław and the Devil. Um, in his first day in New York, he, uh, I mean, he had never been out of his village. He saw a black person for the first time and didn't know, he had no experience. He thought it was the devil. So, uh, this poem is about that. It's, it's the story he told me. What can he know? Never straying from the dirt floors of the farm. Each year a commissar gathering the Tsar's portion of wheat, pigs, and sons who came of age. Or that first day in New York, his elation would shrink to nothing when he froze in the middle of a street, teamsters shouting, Get out of the road, you goddamn Polak talking at the first black man he'd ever seen. Among delivery vans, ice wagons, and vegetable vendors, how could he guess Lucifer's too dazzling for naked eyes? Or that 45 years from then, he'd be selling houses in South Bend to black families moving in as Polish families moved out. Right now, he's not thinking Angel or Black Madonna of Częstochowa. He's thinking the cold knuckle of hell. He's fingering the worthless zwotis in his pocket and the crumbled address of someone from his village. Citizens of the old world look for relatives in the new. A man he thinks is the devil rounds a corner between the battery and Wall Street. 
How can I not love him standing there, surrounded by chaos in the street, as he tries to think if he can hide or run back to the boat or take one step forward and start bargaining? This is um, called Monet Paints His Wife's Portrait on Her Deathbed. Several years ago, there was a Monet show here, and there's a picture of his, his wife's uh, wife on her deathbed. There is so little money, he writes to a friend. He can afford neither paint nor canvas, yet here he is, layering, layering white and blue, a touch of red, the final colors at his disposal. Where else put grief, if not these half dozen strokes against a shawl? His final gesture, blue-white like the others, splashes across her still breast, the rose near her heart. Her graying face, nearly lost among pillows and bed linen, grows as indistinct as his paintings of Vituya reflected in foggy water. But there is no reflection here, nothing that remains steady in the agitated current other than her body. Light striking her pillow like a wedding veil. Um, I too have two more poems to read. This is from another manuscript. Um, somewhat based on the trip to Poland. Uh, the first one is based on a letter that my great grandfather sent to my grandfather somewhere around 1920. Uh, it was written in Polish in a certain dialect of Polish uh, from the Białystok region, which is uh, northeastern Poland. And um, I was able to get someone in Poland to, to translate it. They couldn't get the whole thing because it's a mixture of Russian and Polish and, and probably some Yiddish uh, in there too. So it's, it's a dialect that isn't spoken anymore. It's called On Receiving a Letter from My Great-Grandfather, Serafin Minchewski. He was dying and never knew I'd get it across the great divide of his death and my birth. In his native dialect, in his Bialystok, the freshly cobbled road, the farmhouse of squared fur, the village named after a city in the mountains, but flat as a paper he wrote on, like the fields he plowed margin to margin. Because he was stingy with paper, as he was stingy with land. Because a church taught an idle mind is the playground of the devil. Empty paper is the work of the devil. Too stingy for punctuation. His thoughts rushed together like raindrops splashing past his window before splashing in puddles. The water rising up as the drop splashes down. The water rippling as one thought joins the whole pond of them. Too stingy for nouns. What good are nouns between men? Like raindrops falling 80 years, and now they land in me. It is March. The sky is blue and dry, an enormous wishbone of blue, and my great-grandfather's words slosh inside me. The little waterfalls of his thoughts grow large as bison that have fattened for 80 years. There is no room for a salutation in his letter. The other side is smudged as if by tears. It is laid in my grandfather's drawer since then in a box in my cousin's closet. Can I forgive his stinginess with periods and commas for not writing until the end of his life? Will I let him out of purgatory where Dante says each soul decides when it is time to move up? Or be kind to him so that he may be kind to himself. I forgive him far worse. The difficulty my friend had translating it for me learning along the way the family secrets, the eternal worry over money, our didgeridoo of economics, as Serafin plunges through the soil of Yelena Goda, where Minchevsky still barters his potatoes, Serafin reaching toward me with one hand, the other, like a scarecrow's glove, still grappled in the dust of this world. And the last poem is... Uh, called Jewish Cemetery Rimanov. Rimanov was just a small town uh, where some friends uh, were driving us around. Um, the Jewish cemeteries are mainly overgrown with the headstones leaning. Um, the Catholic cemeteries are extremely well tended. 
course, there are very few Jews left in Poland. Um, but but the um, on, on All Souls Day, which is the same as the Day of the Dead, uh, they're almost like days of celebration in Poland as well. And uh, uh, there are votive candles uh, on the in, in the cemetery. So at night, it looks like it looks like halos uh, emanating from the cemeteries, and, and there, there's the uh, graves are loaded with flowers and so on. <clears throat> Jewish Cemetery, Rimanov. How many dead people my wife's father used to ask are buried in that cemetery? It's an old story, like the chicken and the egg, the chicken and the road. My wife, a girl then, began counting the stones holding the dead in place when he answered, laughing, all of them. Standing in front of this forgotten cemetery in an almost forgotten town, I find myself asking how many dead Jews are buried here. And though I never got the joke or stood in the ash pits of Birkenau, my tongue has the answer already, all of them. The stones gleaming, twisting back into earth in purple-gray drizzle buried here under the stork's empty nests. As many as on the bus to Krakow, yes, all. As many as the rags hanging in fields to scare the crows, yes. Across the road, people are grooming graves of Catholic ancestors, preparing for All Souls Day, where the weightlessness of flowers equals the weight of headstones. The rest of the dead are here, under the inscriptions, under tansy and yarrow. I came looking among these lowering skies and one-way streets as though for a part of myself, and I found all of them, the heavy earth, the light bones, the rest of us standing at the fence, looking in. task, before I point out that there are many fine writers in the audience tonight, I'm always afraid to introduce you because I'll miss someone, so if I miss you, raise your hand. Diane Wilson, Phoebe Hansen, holding that beautiful baby Joseph, who's probably going to be a famous writer someday. Ms. Schmielars, right here. Anybody else? Am I missing anyone? Oh, excuse me, I'm looking right at you. William Reichert, yes. So we're very honored to have all of you here as well. Yes, Susan Steger Welsh. Okay, who else have I missed? See, it's always dangerous to do this. You're all probably fabulous writers, but I, at least I've heard these Maisie, people read. Maisie Johnson. Maisie Johnson. Yes, yes. <laughs> see, you see. So we'll give you all a round of applause. <laughs> now, because this reading is sponsored by Sassy, I have the task of asking you to contribute a little something to SASE. What happens is that the Metropolitan Arts Council has a matching grant, so whatever is collected at the readings, they match, and the poets are actually paid, if you can imagine that, about enough for parking, right? <laughs> <laughs> parking for a few days. Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> yes, there you go. So here you are. Thank you. It's all tax deductible, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, it is a great honor to introduce our next reader. I've been a great fan of her work for about 25 weeks, I would say, when I first heard her read. Um, her book, this is, her, this is your first book, right, Emily? Yes. First book, Emily Carter. She's the author of Glory Goes and Gets Some from Coffee House Press. I think this book is won about every award that is possible to win. She, um, it's a collection of 21 interlinked short stories full of the wild music Emily strives for. I love that line. Came right out of a press release, I think. But it's a good one. And um, Publishers Weekly calls her work intense, edgy, boldly candid, and it is. Some of these stories were originally published in the New Yorker, and get this, the title story was selected by Garrison Keillor, 
for the anthology Best American Short Stories of 1998. Emily is starting a new job tomorrow, so uh, we are especially honored that she would use her energy to be here to read for us tonight. Emily Carter. in the middle of the night when there is nothing to move your digital clock radio will come on all at once for no other reason than that it's as you've always suspected inanimate objects aren't inanimate <laughs> but are instead possessed of soul and will and mean you no good at first, it will sound far away, tinny soft and static, like an orange and yellow merengue floating out from behind corrugated bodega awnings, or like a memory of listening to music in a Jersey seaside town with its striped revival tents, stone canals, and long gone from high school students manning the arcades by the Atlantic with their shag haircuts and pebble gray eyes. Then the sound will become audibly swollen. And even though you try to switch the dial, switch it off, yank the plug, let the gadget sail, clacking and clattering into the wall, its chatter won't stop, but instead only grows more persistent until you can discern different elements, different voices, all saying things you don't want to hear. And this, my darling, is radio death. This is radio fear coming to you straight and true and live over the airtight, airless waves of longing, and we are playing all the hits tonight. The voice of that person you loved and left singing in small, chanting words, a child song, you remember that one, and the conspicuous absence of laughter after that last misplaced joke you tried to tell at your uncle's wake, your uncle whom nobody liked, but didn't really want to hear jokes about at that particular moment. We are replaying that two silence of seconds of silence in the mix forever and ever. And the sound of the counselor at your resort your parents took you to announcing your win in the swimming race. The win you had cheated for by pushing off with your feet more running than swimming. Your fake panting, the sound of your desire to win. And your fake panting sounds when you were doing the ding dong with that boy you met or that girl you met at that bar or that AA meeting who you didn't know well enough to to talk to about your genitals so you just pretend to be swept up in the moment. <laughs> That cry of faux pleasure will echo like a dial tone all night on this all-night station. Don't turn over, darling. I'm right here. I'm right here like an eternal mosquito coming to you on a frequency of megawatts too large for you to even conceive of, and I'm never leaving you again. This is all-night good-time radio. And you'll never have to be alone in the dark the way I was. But it turned out it wasn't such a good idea to leave me alone with no lights on because now we're going to replay again and again my fear of the dark. Except it will be yours now. And there's no getting out of it ever. No getting up to turn on the light. There will be no light ever again except from the green dashboard glow of the digital clock which will never change to the next minute, and no sound either except the sound of my voice replaying over and over again the litany of times that you failed, or might fail, or might have failed without knowing it. Call me a prick if you like, the prick of conscience. Oh, relax my own sweet country tis of thee till the dawn's early light. This is me on the radio, and I'm coming to you, coming to you, coming to you live. Now that we know each other a little better, um, thanks for coming out on this on this uh, cold and 
and snowy something. I feel like one of your sunflowers kind of dark and droopy, and, and I too have been bit by an early frost. <laughs> I have some, some love poems in here to uh, St. Paul, but um, uh, you already know what it looks like here. So, <laughs> all right. I was trying to I was trying to break this up with something more cheerful. <laughs> But I, I can't find anything. <laughs> On an early Sunday morning, a reporter called to ask me questions about women with AIDS. Don't waste your time with me, I told her. I'm nothing more in the scheme of things than a rather charming statistical anomaly. Meaning, meaning, I come from a wealthy family, supportive, who provided me with a safety net, its resemblance to a spider web notwithstanding. I don't have children. I don't have problems getting access to medical care. I don't have to buy the groceries for the family when I'm too exhausted to stand up for more than 10 minutes straight. And I don't have a husband who will feel betrayed enough to resort to physical expression if the house is still cluttered and dusty at the end of the day. I don't have your usual problems, in other words, either boy or girl style. Go talk to somebody else. For instance, I suggested you could talk to Emilio. He repaired broken air conditioners and refrigerators, a trade he picked up upstate. Upstate being how a certain East Coast demographic refers to prisons, the prisons being mostly upstate. I looked up at him, I, looked up, I hooked up with him mainly because he was half Puerto Rican, and he looked entirely Puerto Rican and therefore must have had access to drugs. He was the kind of Puerto Rican man I could relate to, not like most Puerto Rican men who seemed mainly involved in going to work, taking out the garbage, and teasing their children. He was also just the kind of boy I would hook up with. His heart was in the right place for being a street-smart, tough guy, but his physique was unsuited. He was bird-skinny with painful shoulder blades and long-lashed emerald eyes beautiful, but girly girl. When we walked together on the street, if anyone said anything to me, he would draw himself up and issue a series of threats. And during the time that I knew him, his nose got broken once and his ribs fractured several times. We drove around in his employer's van at night when I could sneak out of one of the places I was staying, either my boyfriend's or my parents'. I didn't allow him to meet my parents naturally. They put up with men who had beaten me up. They put up with 33-year-old homeless musicians. They put up with painters who constantly asked them to invest in their art, but they would not put up with air conditioner repairmen. My parents are intellectuals. Emilio often said he loved me, and I liked him very much. He had a sweet spirit, and as much of a fuck-up as he was, he had a certain bravery. Even when we were in the early stages of opiate withdrawal, he managed to stay cheerful, but I began to see less of him when it became apparent that outside of his van, which was a good place to fix, he was as much of a liability as an asset. He never had any money. I told him I was going to have sex with a local dry goods merchant in the neighborhood where we went to buy drugs on a sex for drugs exchange basis. I was still well enough then that I could actually consider the arrangement. If you do that, I will tell everyone you are a slut, he said regretfully. Who is everyone, I wondered. Who did he know that knew me outside of one or two passing junkies with whom our exchanges were limited to, you know what's open and they'll be back in five minutes? Emilio, feeling flushed, once brought me some flowers which we put in a can of water on the dashboard of his van, and after that, I didn't see him for a while. The next time I heard from him 
was when the wife of a friend of his called me saying he'd given the friend my number as a possible source of bail. My boyfriend, who was ready to kick me out of his apartment, hovered ragefully over my shoulder as I took the call. He knew what was up. My parents knew what was up. Money was missing everywhere, and they wouldn't let me in the house. I didn't want to stay on the street having no skill for it. I was considering suicide, but I wanted to die happy, and that would take drug money, which in turn would take time and effort to come by. In other words, it was a normal day. I'm sorry. No bail for Amelia today. He called a week later while my boyfriend was out. I was in a better mood, having obtained what I needed to want to live a little longer and having injected it into a vein in my wrist about ten minutes early. Amelia, why are you in jail? Well, you know, I was driving the wrong car at the, at the wrong time. Listen, he went on. Some of the girls send us stuff in here. A pair of your panties, a ribbon from your hair, whatever. I told him I'd see what I could do. I really wore underwear, and my hair was too short for ribbons, and women only wore ribbons in their hair in old songs anyway. The poor man, to have only me for his idea of a woman out there. Don't call me again, though, I said. I'll write to you. My boyfriend gets angry. I thought you said he didn't mind, which was something I told him once when I was expecting him to call with some dope. Things were getting a little more desperate in my corner. My boyfriend was certainly going to kick me out any minute if I couldn't think of any more excuses about missing objects and pawn tickets. The phone rang during one of our morning conversations. It's Emilio. Listen, sweetheart, I have to tell you something. Emilio, I said with one eye on my boyfriend who was pointing to the door he wanted me to walk out of with a dollar fifteen in my pocket and a January sleep storm spattering the street. I told you not to call me. Okay, he said with perfect equanimity and hung up. Do you have to be a brilliant plot predictor to guess what it was Emilio had to tell me and how he thought I should know and go get the test? No, you do not. And in hindsight, there's not a doubt in my mind what news Emilio had to share. What he was trying to do was the decent thing. Now, eight years later, where is Emilio? Asked me a question on quantum physics. He had no girlfriend, no mother, no father, no friends who could come and see him. He may have died there. He may have died soon after. He may still be alive, spending his life shuttling between methadone and medical clinics. I'm living in the love of my family and the bosom of my world. I live within the warm, firelit circle of privilege under a whispering Midwestern sky that flushes down on the snow-crushed streets these January mornings. So don't ask me anything about it. Find Emilio for me. Ask him. Tell him I say hello from Minneapolis. I was, this, this poem was uh, inspired by uh, uh, an essay by Lafcadio Hearn, who um, traveled all his life um, as a, does anybody know what he was, a merchant marine? Do you know anything about him? No, okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he traveled all his life, and he would stop at different places to see if he could find a culture or a community where he would feel at home. And he never really did until I think he was in his 60s when he, he married a, a, a Japanese woman and, and settled down on an island um, with her and they, they ran like a dry cleaning store. Um, but during his travels, um, he was also quite religious and he, he heard these women um, singing as they were coming home uh, from washing clothes by the creek and they were all carrying huge uh, piles of clothes on their heads. And they were singing, uh, lay your burden down. And he, he began to wonder about the time and when it would come that we could uh, all lay our burdens down, and, and literally. And uh, this uh, came back to me when I was in the laundromat and everybody was uh, doing their laundry, um, you know, with lots of kids and, and 
and, and clatter, and I was thinking this would really be a perfect time for um, God to come down, and never mind the loaves and fishes, how about he folds our laundry for us? <laughs> Uh, no one knows exactly when the merciful end of time will finally arrive but when it does it's making its first stop at the city coin wash and dry on the corner of Nicolette and 28 where else would the end of time pick to enter the universe but at a laundromat on a tumble down avenue with no trees in a third tier metropolis like Minneapolis city we love no one will notice it at first because the end of time seeps in like the smell of warm, wet earth in March, even though the wind still blows and the sky is gray as frozen iron. The end of time, let's call it mercy, will seep in through the clouded windows that make up the walls of the wash and dry like dust filtering through shafts of light, a thin, dancing ribbon of invisible ink entering a slow-moving river. <clears throat> and what will happen is simple. The silent breeze of mercy will blow through everything, starting with the wet socks and logo-blasted t-shirts sudsing behind the clear round windows of the washing machines. The squawking children clambering over mountainous piles of dirty clothes will stop to stare transfixed, their eyes as glossy as the dark gleaming portholes with things spinning around inside them. Soap suds begin to twinkle like diamonds in the blackness of the double loaders, but the din continues on a Sunday evening like any Sunday evening, coins jangling out of change machines as the manager, a grinning woman with straggling mouse-colored hair, hips that roll like ocean liners, and a pale pock-marked face blares out her friendly claxon bellow into the noise, 45 is free! Got two minute wait on 18 over here by the extractor. It's the man with the hockey helmet hairdo and the homemade identical fuck rice burners tattoos running up both his mo rope muscled arms who notices it first. He's folding baby clothes. Tiny underpants with dinosaurs on them and striped navy and white ladies work blouses that belong to his wife who is working right now in the office of an industrial park somewhere in the sprawling drone of the outer limits an hour and 15 minute bus ride away from her husband, her little boy, and their poor room house on Portland Avenue. Pausing in mid-fold, he catches a glimpse of the manager. Large and homely, as always, in her too tight stonewashed jeans. And suddenly, she is what, for lack of a better word, he's going to call beautiful. Her smile beams, her eyes blaze, and the jangle of keys at her ample waist sounds like the church bells in his hometown of La Crosse, Wisconsin, started chiming all at once. Aware that he's caught on, she smiles more broadly and lets go of the metal mop bucket she's been pushing since she was born and lets it slide across the tilted linoleum floor. Children skittering out of its way like flocks of startled ducklings. Unstoppable, it continues its implacable magisterial role past the two women with burnt orange hair and high, sharp cheekbones who are holding what looks like all the laundry in the world. <laughs> Bending down to the pile, putting the clothes on the table and folding as they talk, talking about white women who don't care who sees their panties, waving those nasty things around like searchlights at a supermarket opening. I wash my lingerie at home in the sink, the one is saying, when her mouth drops open as she and her friend look at the table to find their clothes are folded neat perfect and packed as tightly as the feathers on the wing of a soft white bird. And all over City Coin, the bending and folding and sorting stops while people stand and stare at each other with the same expression on their faces as if they finally gotten the same joke. The three apprentice nail technicians from Lamb's Beauty Salon across the parking lot who had been bleaching the table linens, unroll their bolts of satiny hair, and begin to laugh. And laughter is how you'll know 
the merciful end of time has made its first stop. That and the people running outside to tell everyone. All the customers in City Coin scatter down the block, shouting and tumbling, and the street will be left in silence. The store windows will catch the blue evening light and start to shine like eyes filled with religion. Thank you so much um, to everyone who read and everyone who came out. It's, it's great to see you all here, and it's, it's great to see people come out in the snow to hear um, words and poetry. It does my heart good. Thank you. my heart good to hear that wonderful work. Jim Selar is here from Coffee House Press who published Emily's book. Did you bring any books to sell by any chance? No. We'll They're try available to... at Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble and Emily has been named by Barnes and Noble as uh, Discover Great in the Discover Great New Writers series. In the oh. Discover Great New Writers series. And it is Darren yes. think of going into a Barnes and Noble and all those millions of books in there, it makes it all the better. Another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thanks especially to our readers. You were all wonderful. Thanks to Janet Coleman for this wonderful art and please come again. Next, uh, the third Sunday of December, we will have Dorothy Benham, who's a former Miss America, former Broadway star, who will do a little Christmas music. A poet named Robert Samarato, who played with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and was a Zeit guest. Is that how you say that? Zeit guest? At any rate, and he has a lot of poems about music. And Margaret Hesse will be reading also. So we'll be looking for you, but I will, they'll have a very hard time living up to what we heard tonight. Thank you. Another round of applause for the readers. Baby Joseph likes them too. Thank you all.